So whenever you write on the board, write this piece. I would write, yeah. I'm going to write a lot of stuff on the board today. So I would, um, there's just not enough room on your slides that I'm giving you, so then you're just going to kind of get lost. All right, a few things that we need to remember before we go into all of this is that these reactions are occurring through a redox reaction. And you guys need to remember that redox reactions are the transfer of electrons, right? Electricity occurs because electrons flow. So maybe this is not something that you've ever thought about. How does a battery work? How do you power your toys? It, it occurs because there's a flow of electrons, and electrons flow through redox reactions. So you need to recall for a redox reaction how you end up with electrons flowing. And that's through the Leo says Ger, right? So what is this one, Leo? Loss of electrons. And that means what happens to your oxidation number? Does it go up or down? It goes up, right? Going down would be a reduction. That's the one that your brain should make sense with. Reducing means the number goes down. Oxidation means that your oxidation number goes up. So that means that perhaps you have like a Zn with a zero oxidation number going to a Zn plus two, correct? And then loss of electrons would be your two electrons being lost. This is just an example. Remembering this? Yeah. And then the Ger part is a gain of electrons. And so oppositely, your oxidation number needs to go down. And then uh, let's just use an example of Cu plus 2 goes to Cu solid. And so the electrons are being gained, and the oxidation number goes from a plus 2 to a 0. Uh, a video next door. All right, so when we balance uh, half reactions, Remember that we took two different pieces and we would balance them. So say for this example, and we'll look at this on the slides in a moment, I can combine them into making one redox reaction, but right now I wrote out each half reaction, right? So we're going to look at direct transfer redox reactions, and I have a little example set up for you today. And then we'll look at uh, separating them into half cells, and that's really what we're going to focus on, which is a galvanic cell, is separating them into half cells to get the electrons to transfer. So you can see that if something is giving up electrons and something is accepting the electrons, then the electrons flow. When electrons flow, they can be used to power stuff. Uh, so let's just keep that up for now, and then we'll look at a few of these other slides. So what I'm going to show you right now are conversion factors for dimensional analysis. They will give you this problem, which means in turn you're going to see this problem as a multiple choice question and possibly a free response question. You're definitely getting this. So if you get it wrong on your exam, whose fault is it? Yours for not studying and preparing. I'm telling you, I'm giving you this problem in both formats, which means that you need to know how to do the math without your calculator also. It's really simple if you do the tricks that I tell you to do, which is why I asked you to get a separate sheet of paper to kind of write this all out. If you take out your equation sheet that the AP exam gives you, this one, right? Pull it out. It's very helpful for these types of problems because it tells you what I is, what Q is, and what T is, and it gives you the units that you need. So we have I is your current in amps. So we're going to write amps here. It's amperes. They will write it as a capital A, so you'll know that that's your amps. Q is your charge, and this will be in coulombs, which is a C. And then this is obviously time, but it's typically going to be in seconds. They can, though, change this and give you the time in different units, but then you would just convert them. So your units are A, C, and seconds. So if you look at your equation sheet right off the bat, it tells you that if you go across, do you see where it says thermodynamics and electrochemistry? So if you go across to what all of the, um, the letters stand for, basically, it shows you each of those units, right? So what I want you to be able to do is any time that you see the word amp, that you literally cross the word amp out, and you're going to convert it to a conversion factor into coulombs over seconds. Because this is what an amp is equal to, which means that you can change the units to coulombs over seconds. Do you agree? 
So if I say that I'm going to give you an amp, that's a coulomb over a second. If I gave you 4.5 amps, I want you to write 4.5 coulombs per one second. Every single time you see an A or the word amp, I need you to convert it immediately. Because then you'll recognize, oh, this is a conversion factor, which means I can write it either way on the top or the bottom when I'm doing dimensional analysis, right? But if you don't write it as a conversion factor, you think that you should start with amps and you're going to turn it into your known. So maybe you need to write a note for yourself. If amps are given, change the units, exclamation points. Okay, the other thing that I need you to use as a conversion factor is Faraday's constant. So Faraday's constant is going to be given to you, and it says in one Faraday, that is equal to, now your equation sheet on the AP exam gives you a more accurate number. So if you're doing free response, remember we're going to use this. If we're doing it as a multiple choice question, we probably won't even use 96,500. We'll just round that up to 100,000. But in general, most people use 96,500. It's just that you have to know if this is a free response question, you have to use all of your digits. So we're going to say 96,485, and you can look right there. It tells you coulombs per, so we write our line, mole of electrons. So we write one mole of electrons. If you don't write things out as a numerator and a denominator, you're going to not see it as a conversion factor. It's like writing MPH. What does MPH stand for? But miles per hour is a conversion factor. This is not, right? You don't see that. So when you see a Faraday, you write coulombs per mole of electrons so that you can use it. When you see an amp, you write coulombs per second. They can give you in a problem, they can give you uh, a fraction of a Faraday. So say I give you 0.5 Faradays, then you're going to do a dimensional analysis problem where you say 1 Faraday equals 96,485 coulombs. So then you'll just calculate how many coulombs right off the bat you're starting with. And then you might, in fact, you will, use this calculation again, which turns out really easy for you because you'll just end up canceling it to calculate how many moles of electrons. This is sort of where you're going to go. You'll see that in your homework tonight. So when you're doing a multiple choice problem, that's just super simple because it's going to cancel itself out for you. Okay? I think I got that all on video. Um, so if you see a Faraday, you're converting, and if you see an amp, you're going to convert. Um, all right, let's try these problems. <coughs> so it says, how much charge passes through a cross-section of a wire that is carrying 0.987 amps of current for 12.3 minutes? So immediately, this should not make any sense to you because we don't really deal with any electricity in chem besides like this one section. Um, so the first thing you should do is change that word charge because charge isn't a unit, right? You need a unit because that's what you're calculating. So you know when we do dimensional analysis, I will write down our known is blah, blah, blah. Our unknown is we're trying to find, say, a number of grams or something like that. What is the unit for charge? You're going to look it up because you probably don't know it. And it's right here. It's given to you. I try to show you where your resources are, right, because you may not remember this come May. You go and find charge, and it says coulombs. So we don't want to find charge. We want to find coulombs. That's what we're looking for. And I want to know how many or how many coulombs passes through this wire. And I have two numbers. So now I have to figure out which one do I start with my dimensional analysis problem. One is a known. One is a conversion factor. What did I tell you to do? Convert what? So anytime I get amps, the immediate thing to do is to immediately convert that to coulombs per second, right? So I'm just going to change this to say 0.987 coulombs over one second. This is my conversion factor, right? So what do I start my problem with? I'm going to start with minutes, right? Because I'm trying to get from minutes to coulombs, which 
clearly this is the conversion factor that gets me there, right? So I'm going to take this problem and I'm going to start with 12.3 minutes, but I have to convert minutes in one minute, there's 60 seconds. And then I can use this conversion factor. One second equals 0.987 coulombs. Do you see how if you didn't convert that amp to a coulomb over a second, you would have no way to get there? All right, and then we'll solve for that. So go ahead and throw that into your calculator. And we're going to use sig figs for this, recognizing that 60 seconds into one minute doesn't have significant figures. It's unlimited. So we're taking our 12.3 and multiplying it by 0.987 and 60. So for three sig figs here, you get 728 coulombs. So you can visualize this almost like you have a switch, you turn it on for 12.3 minutes, and you have electrons flowing, and how many coulombs passes through there? That's what you just calculated, okay? This is sort of breaking this section, this question, part B, down for you, but really what the questions will do on the AP exam is they'll just ask you this. They'll just say, how many moles of electron passes through a cross-section of a wire that is carrying 0.987 amps of current for 12.3 minutes? It's not going to take you to coulombs first. It's just going to ask you directly how many moles of electrons there are. So I'm not going to do this into two separate problems. I'm just going to show it to you as one dimensional analysis problem. So if that says 0.987 coulombs at this point, now we're just going to convert our coulombs into moles of electrons. And where is your conversion factor for that? Faraday's constant, right? You have to know two conversion factors to do these problems, your amps and your Faraday's, every single time. They're always the same, every single time. It's just depending on what you're going to start with. But you will always use these two types of conversion factors, moles of electrons and coulombs in seconds. So it's 96,485 coulombs is to one mole of electrons. So now we're going to calculate that. Now, obviously, uh, we already did calculate it. We could just throw it on to the end of the other problem. You may get different significant figures if you do that than uh, me doing it right now. So 7.55 times 10 to the negative third moles of electrons. Good. So the three problems that I'm giving you tonight, well, two of them, are only this. That's it. Because I didn't get far enough, I won't get far enough along today to give you any other homework problems. So this is literally all we're going to do. And the other question is just asking you to write redox reactions, which you've already learned how to do. So you're just kind of repracticing how to write oxidation numbers correctly and going from one substance to another. So any questions on this? I will advance this a little bit more as we practice redox reactions because eventually I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you a reaction, a specific reaction, and ask you about moles of electrons. And we'll learn, um, like if say I give you Zn plus 2 plus 2 electrons goes to Zn solid, then this is a number of electrons that we can incorporate into that. And then we can end up using this as dimensional analysis and say, for every two moles of electron, I have one zinc ion. And then I can calculate, or zinc solid, I can calculate the mass of zinc that will be plated out. So you'll use like stoichiometry as a two to one ratio. We're going to get there also. So you could do two moles of electrons is to one mole of zinc. One mole of zinc is to how many grams of zinc. And you could figure out actually how many grams of zinc would be produced from this reaction. But we'll get there. All right, so the next slide we're just going to look at is writing, I believe, redox reactions. All right, so what I have set up for you is um, in this speaker is this reaction exactly. So you have a copper ion solution and you have a zinc solid, and they mix together, and they spontaneously will react. So that means that delta G is what? Thank you, Carol. Negative. negative. Spontaneous reactions are negative, right? Because that means they have it. It doesn't mean it happens necessarily fast. 
It just means that it's going to happen. So my copper plus two ions, I had used uh, copper two sulfate. So that's the reason why it's green. And then I put in here solid pieces of zinc. I didn't have a strip of zinc. I just dumped in solid pieces of zinc. So what spontaneously happens is that the copper plus two ions through redox will turn into solid copper, right? So I should literally see solid copper floating around eventually. And then the zinc that is solid comes off into zinc ions floating around the solution. So this continues to happen until one of them runs out. Either all the zinc gets used up and there's no more zinc, or all the copper two ions are no longer floating around in the solution. So I'm going to walk this around to show you because you should recognize that there's literally copper floating in here. So I did this at like 10.30 today, and nothing really happened right away. But by the time you guys came in here, you all were like, ooh, what's that? So in this reaction, over time, all the copper plus two ions convert to copper solids. So who's being oxidized and who's being reduced? Copper is being reduced. So the reduced one is the easiest one, right? So you have to remember how to do oxidation numbers here. So your oxidation numbers are really simple because there are zero here. The charge is given to you here, plus two, and zero here. So this goes down, so that's reduction. And this goes up, so that's oxidation. So this will continue to happen until the copper ions literally are plated onto the solid piece of zinc, which is why in my beaker just now, I can knock those loose. But if I didn't knock them loose, they would all just stay perfectly sitting on that zinc piece. And then when you kind of move it around, the copper uh, solid actually comes off. So every time that you see one of these reactions, you've already done the redox reactions. This is just a reminder. I mean, you've guys done far more intense reactions than this. When you see a solid metal placed into a solution containing metal ions, it always is this type of redox reactions. These are the simplest ones that you use, right? So try this one just to recall. A copper penny is dropped into a solution of silver fluoride. You do. One of them is given to you. You have one substance. It's a solid. You have two substances, and you can make a choice. And it's an obvious choice out of which one's going to be oxidized or reduced. Copper solid, Cu solid, has what charge? Zero. Can I make that negative? No. Nope. So that's going to go what? To a positive. Do you know the charge of copper? We're going to stick with plus two, but it also could be a plus one. Remember, you got to look at it. You got your plus two, plus three, plus two, plus three. Copper hits, and it's plus one, plus two. And then when you get to zinc, plus two, and then tin and lead, remember, are two and four. All right, so copper, we're going to just go with the plus two charge here. And then I have my choice. And this is, it's a solution, right? So my choice is I either have Ag plus floating around or F minus floating around. Well, clearly this is going to be oxidized, didn't it? There's no ch other way. There, this can't do anything else but be oxidized. So if this is oxidized, I have to choose the reduction. Is it silver or fluorine that's going to be reduced? It has to be because you can't make F minus two, right? The only place where F's gonna go is to F two, right? which would be zero. So it has to be the silver. So then you have Ag plus, plus one electron goes to Ag solid. And then what do you do? You have to balance your electrons, right? So I need both of my electrons to cancel out. So I end up with two Ag plus two electrons yields two Ag solid. And then my electrons will cancel and then I'll just combine the whole thing. I'm going to let the slide show you it because it's much neater than my handwriting. So you end up with two silver. So don't forget to balance for charge. If you didn't balance for charge for this, you would have just ended up with the reaction and no coefficients. So they will likely give you reactions. And then you will have to write out for yourself the redox reaction. This redox reaction is really important for where we're going because it tells you who's being oxidized and who's being reduced, right? So the next slide I'm going to show you, we're going to split the reactions into half of reactions. A galvanic cell is when you take both of those reactions that we just saw and we split them into two opposite sides and we put a wire between them and the electrons transfer. This 
is a direct transfer. There's electrons transferring in here, but I can't harness that electron transfer. But I can if I separate the two different reactions and I attach a wire. So sort of like with alligator clips, you could attach it to the electrodes. I'll show you in the next slide. And you'll transfer electrons through that, through a pathway. And that's obviously different than the direct transfer there. This is always spontaneous, which means that delta G is going to be negative for all galvanic, and I'm going to use the word working cells, because they may give you a scenario and you have to figure out if it actually would produce voltage or not, because some uh, setups won't produce a voltage because it's incorrectly done. But if it's going to work, then delta G is going to be negative for sure. And you'll see that your voltage will be positive. You can't have a negative volt. Did you ever pick up a battery? It says like 12 volt battery, 9 volt battery. No? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody doesn't know. <laughs> but yeah, they have actual voltages on them. And I'll talk to you later about voltage and like what that actually means. But if you get, you can't, you don't pick up a negative 12 volt battery. You pick up a 12 volt battery and it's positive, right? There's positive voltage there. So if you end up with a negative voltage, it's not going to work, and then therefore delta G would be positive. But if it's going to work, that's why I wrote working, then delta G will be negative. Uh, chemical energy is converted into electrical energy that moves electrons. I think this is the picture. All right. I have so much to say about this slide, and you have no space to write it. Okay, like I don't even think that I'll get through the end of class and I probably won't hit the next slide. So I would get your little sheet of paper and write your heart out on here, everything that I write down. Okay, because every single one of your pictures on your exam questions are going to look like this. And if I don't give you a picture, you need to draw this so that you understand it. Your understanding of what's going on here is so important for every question that I'm going to ask you. If you get this, you're fine. If you're confused, then you need to stay after. Or rewatch the lecture. What? No. The picture is great. Small or large, the picture is good. What I have to say about it is what you need to just jot down. All right. I'm going to try to pose like a bunch of different ways that questions will be asked to you. The first thing that they could do is they could give you a reaction like you just wrote out your redox reaction, right? And they could ask you then to label the cells. Labeling your cells means that you have to identify where oxidation occurs and where reduction occurs. And then we use these specific terms called the anode and the cathode. So when you label the anode and the cathode, you have to identify what occurs at each of those spots. So the easiest way to remember this is that the anode belongs with oxidation because they both start with vowels. These are the ways that I remember things. Do you do that? You have to remember stuff, right? So you come up with some sort of trick to help you remember. Like my STP spells stop, right? Got to come up with something. <laughs> Except I wrote something else, right? Um, and then at the cathode is where reduction occurs, and that's because they both start with consonants. So that's how I remember who belongs with who. Or you just memorize it. All right, so the anode is where oxidation pl takes place. And remember for yourself that this is a loss of electrons. This is a gain of electrons. And the way that you recognize that is that the oxidation number goes up, and here the oxidation number goes down. These are all things that we just have to keep reminding ourselves of. ON goes up, ON goes down. That stands for oxidation number. All right, so say I gave you the reaction in words, and I asked you to write it, and you wrote this, right? You have this setup here. You don't have this little arrow with the electrons. You don't have the word that says anode. You don't even have this arrow showing you the ions because you're going to label that all yourself. So how do you know how to do that? The first thing you do is you label this for yourself. You tell yourself, oh, I already know what's being oxidized and which one's being reduced, right? I already know that zinc is being oxidized. Don't I just by looking at the oxidation numbers? So if I know that zinc's being oxidized, look, I'm going to look at the two electrodes here. 
This one says zinc. So this one is where the zinc is going to take its solid and produce Zn plus two ions, which is literally what's happening in here in the direct transfer. The solid pieces of zinc are going into zinc ions. You following that? So that's why it will ask you to show, like, what is this species? And then sometimes you have to directly draw the arrow showing that the zinc solid is going to the Zn plus two. Then it'll say label your anode and cathode. Well, I'm gonna obviously label this anode because I already told myself that the zinc is being oxidized and A and O are vowels. Okay, so then you label this as your anode. You okay? What if they didn't give you this and they asked you to write this from this picture? You would look to see what's occurring from here to here, right? This is going from, this is your reactant, this is your product. You can think of it like that, right? That the arrow is showing you the progression of the reaction. So you started with solid zinc and you went to Zn plus two. Will they so, show what? Will they show the arrow? Yeah, sometimes, it, yeah. In that case, like what I'm explaining, they will. I didn't say this earlier, I need to say this abundantly clear. Almost all the examples on my slides are left to right. But if I'm standing on the other side of this, it is right to left. It does not mean that the anode is always on the left. Sometimes students think that because all of my pictures are left to right. But I could just reverse this and now it's right to left. Do you understand that? So where the anode is located has nothing to do with its location on my slides. Please, please, please understand that, okay? So you're going to have to identify the anode and cathode based on where electrons are being lost and where they're being gained. So then how do I know that this is the cathode? because cathode is where the reduction occurs, right? And reduction is where your oxidation number goes down. So Cu plus two went to Cu solid. So the Cu plus two ions are coming out of the solution and going into the copper solid. Everybody understanding that? And so then I would label this the cathode end because that's where reduction is occurring. So you're gonna always be looking for like what is happening on each piece of these half cells and then you would label them accordingly, either the reduction of the oxidation and then the anode and the cathode. Um, all right, so I'm gonna pose a question to you, don't call out. Which, which electrode is going to be getting larger? This is literally like a battery, okay? So as soon as this battery starts, we're going to end up with one of these disintegrating away, one of the electrodes literally just disappears, and one of them grows much larger. Copper is going to get larger, right? So, I mean, that makes sense, because your ions are forming solid, you're going to get more and more solid, and eventually all of your zinc is going to just be coming to go into solution. Agreed? Okay, so now let's talk about the flow of electrons. Yep? So is your cathode always the one Yes. And that has to do with what I'm about to talk about. Your electrons are always going to flow from your anode to your cathode. So your electron flow is always from the anode to the cathode. They love to ask you to label the flow of electrons on the diagram. So you literally would do this. You put an arrow and you show the direction of it. Got it? And you do it a few times and you show the direction of it. Don't try to be sneaky on my exam and just write electrons and then like tell me later, oh, well, I meant that the arrow was supposed to go this way because you're not sure where it could go. And that's why I'm telling you that this could be the reverse, right? Electrons could flow this way because I could switch the picture. So don't just assume that it's left to right always. So why is it always from the anode to the cathode? Yes, what does oxidation mean? It loses electrons. So as soon as it's losing its electrons, they start flowing through this wire, right? They head this direction and then they go into your cathode where it's going to accept electrons and reduce the species there. So this is how electricity powers something like a light bulb or your toy car or whatever you're doing, right? Electrons flow, power is given to it, the light bulb lights up. Some of the questions on the AP exam will talk about switches. A switch just means that it's preventing the electrons to flow 
and you close the switch and then it prevents it to, it, I mean, sorry, turns it back on, right? That's exactly what's happening when you turn on your switch for something. So electrons begin to flow and they go into the solution. Um, all right, so now we're going to talk about the salt bridge. Any questions before that? Nothing. The other class had lots of interesting questions. No? I will. At the end, we'll talk about voltage and all sorts of stuff. What? We're going to talk about the sulfate now, right? So in my own solution here, which is direct transfer, I ha the only way to get ions is to take something that would dissolve, right? So it's something that's going to be a spectator ion. So I chose copper 2 sulfate. Copper 2 sulfate is soluble. It goes into the water and it dissolves. So now I have copper plus 2 ions floating around, sulfate ions. But the sulfate ions are what? What are they called? They have a special name. Spectator ions because they're not involved, right? The redox reaction is just that. There's nothing going on in there with the sulfate ions. So if we separate this into two half cells, we use spectator ions. Spectator ions are group 1A, always. Ammonium and nitrates, right? But if I stick a group 1A with a sulfate, then that's also going to be soluble. So the salt bridge is super important for you to understand. The main thing, like if you can't remember anything about the salt bridge, if they ask you something and I ask you something about the salt bridge, there's one main purpose for it, and that is to maintain neutrality. Like memorize that little phrase and that might earn you a point. It maintains neutrality in the cell. If the cell's not neutral, the whole battery dies. And now when I say a battery dies, what do you know that means? Electrons cease to flow, right? That's how you get electricity. That's how you get power. Electrons are flowing. Electrons are flowing. And when electrons stop flowing, then your battery dies, right? And your little device no longer works. In fact, you probably have dealt with this many times. Or at least I do a lot now because my kids' creepy toys all of a sudden will like be downstairs and I'll hear something like, <laughs> right? And as the battery is dying, all of a sudden it gets this little surge of electrons and it makes some noise or something, if it's an audio device, all of a sudden it starts slowing down because the electron flow is not reaching it as it should be, right? Electrons are flowing, flowing, giving the energy to it, and then all of a sudden there's no more electrons, so it's not powering it the same way that it should. So without the salt bridge, salt bridge, it immediately dies. And the reason is because electrons can't flow. So let's take, for example, the anode. At the anode, zinc goes into Zn plus 2. If there's no salt bridge, okay, I get a buildup of what kind of charge, positive or negative? Positive. positive, right? Because this is going from a 0 to a plus 2 state. So in this half cell, all of a sudden I get this buildup of positive charge. What is the charge of an electron? Negative. So what's going to happen? Positive and negative cancel. Attract. It's not math class. They're going to attract to each other, right? So if you want even flow of electrons, you can't get it because this is going to attract it, right? Well, say we maintain neutrality here somehow, but over here we don't. What are we losing over here? We're losing a positive charge here. So then this one, right, is going to have a buildup of negative charge for whatever's floating in this half cell. So if this has a negative buildup, what are the charge of electrons? Negative, what will happen? They will reject it or repel it, right? And the electrons won't be accepted here, so electrons cease to flow. So without a salt bridge, your electrons just completely stop flowing. So what you do is within this little barrier here, your salt bridge, you have positive ions and negative ions. They definitely have asked this question before on the AP exam. They ask you to draw the salt bridge and show which direction the ions go in. So you have to show that the positive ions are always going to be given over here because they need to gain positivity. And over here, our negative ions go into the anode. So the negative ions have to go in because I'm creating positive ions, right? And so in order to maintain neutrality, the negative ions go in and balance them out. Notice that the charge of zinc is what? Plus 2. What's the charge of sulfate? Minus 2. So that maintains its neutrality. Not only do you need to maintain neutrality in your half cell, the bridge needs to maintain neutrality also. Otherwise, it's going to attract or repel uh, ions in its own 
bridge. So if it deposits a sulfate ion out of the bridge on this end, it will accept a sulfate ion into the bridge at this end. Like this happens like that. I can't snap. It happens like that, right? So it's not like all of a sudden one piece is getting more positive and it's waiting for the other one. It just all happens in conjunction with the other. So let's jot this all down, okay? So uh, let's erase this part. At the anode, as positive ions enter the solution, the salt bridge deposits negative ions into the solution to maintain neutrality. Without this, a buildup of positive charge would attract electrons and electron flow would cease or stop. So this is where you would get a buildup of positive charge. Maybe I'll pause this in school. So the next piece then, I want to just point out this one more time. This is where your buildup of positive charge would occur. So if you don't have sulfate ions entering to neutralize this, then the electrons are attracted to this solution on this end, and then the electrons stop flowing, right? So now let's talk about what happens on your, and your cathode end. At the cathode, we're going to just write here, because you have to be able to explain this. At the cathode, as uh, positive ions leave the solution, because I'm going to write the reaction out for you. For example, Cu plus 2 goes to Cu solid, right? They're leaving the solution. A buildup of negative ions, and let's be specific, negative spectator ions, because those are the ones that are just floating around in there. A buildup of negative spectator ions um, would occur. and electrons would be repelled. Yep. So if they're gonna, if this is not gonna happen, the salt bridge is going to deposit what kind of ions in there? Positive or negative? will deposit positive ions into the cathode. So in my example here, how many positive ions is it going to distribute? One. Two. Two, because how many, how much of a charge am I losing here? I'm losing two positive, right? So then if I'm going to be depositing a sodium ion into it, sodium only has a plus one charge. So in order to maintain neutrality, I have to dump two sodium ions in there. Following? No. Yeah. Um, all right, and then the last piece of this is that the salt bridge itself needs to maintain neutrality. So if the salt bridge is losing sulfate ions, a sulfate ion comes in from the other side. If it's losing sodium on one side, then it's going to enter it from the other side. Okay? And it can also enter the zinc into there. It can certainly enter different positive ions. Uh, let me write that over here. So the salt bridge also needs neutrality. And ions flow 
in and out to maintain it. All right, sometimes the exam is going to ask you to pick an appropriate substance to put into your salt bridge. So what are you looking to put in? Something that's going to be soluble, right? Something that's going to be a spectator ion. Now, it may show you that you're putting something in like a barium. Barium tends to precipitate. If that occurs, what will happen to your cell is not necessarily like cell death. It doesn't immediately kill the battery. It's just that it could slow it down very, very quickly. So if you started to, say, perhaps precipitate this out, and you end up with a precipitate over here, right? You will continue to still produce zinc ions because you're still going to end up with oxidation occurring here, and your salt bridge is still going to kind of try to maintain neutrality, but at some point you're going to lose ions in order to maintain neutrality, and it's going to stop much faster than it would if you're not precipitating, right? Like as long as your salt bridge can maintain neutrality, ions just go in and out, in and out, and the salt bridge should never be your issue for why your battery dies. Your issue for why your battery dies is because all of this is gone and all of this went into the copper, which is why I was saying with my direct transfer, depending on which one's the limiting reactant, this will stop at some point, right? Because the ions are no longer available or the solid has completely gone away. Everybody following that? So you have your salt bridge, you have your half cells. Oh, when somebody asks why is this positive and negative, you no longer need to know that for the AP exam. But you certainly see that, don't you, on a battery? You see a positive end and you see a negative end, and what do those mean? Why do you think this one's positive? Because it's attracting your electrons. And then this one is giving up the electrons over here, and this is attracting your electrons. So you can think of it that way. The other way that I used to think of it, too, when it was part of the curriculum, is that the cathode has a positive on it, right? The T looks like a positive, so that's where it goes. You don't have to know that, though, for the exam. So in order for electricity to be created, a circuit has to be completed, right? You can't just have electrons floating in a beaker. That's not going to help you. You need to have them go through the wire and to power something, which is why in that video that I showed you first, when he's tapping the battery on his tongue, his tongue is acting as the circuit to complete it, right? And that's why he's getting like a little charge there, getting electrocuted on his tongue. Um, so tomorrow we'll talk about voltage specifically. But some people were asking like, is a 12-volt battery and a 9-volt battery, is one going to die faster than the other? Voltage does not have to do with how fast the battery will die. Voltage has to do with how much power it's going to supply to whatever you're looking at. And we'll talk about tomorrow how, like, potential difference is really going to be the determining factor of electrons. So homework tonight is 6, 7, and 8. All right, so we will finish... Um, discussion of the salt bridge and all that, but your slides have like a little bit more detail for you. So we'll just go over that one more time here. And so it says the two electrons go to the cathode when they're leaving zinc. So zinc is a plus two charge, so it's going to get um, reduced. I'm sorry, oxidized, which means it's giving off of its electrons here. And then we're going to transfer them over here and then at the cathode it's getting reduced. That's what it's showing you here. So it loses two electrons and falls off the anode as it becomes aqueous. Copper gains the two electrons and becomes a solid. So yesterday, we did this. Do you notice already that it's less blue? Yeah. yeah. So why would it be less blue? What color are the copper ions when they're floating around? Blue. Because, right, I put zinc in here solid, and then I put copper ions in, sulfate, copper 2 sulfate, which is blue. And it was really bright blue. But as the copper 2 ions are leaving the solution, they're becoming less blue, and it's forming copper solid. So I'm going to kind of pass this around, I'll take the stir bar out so that you guys don't stir it up at all. But you can literally see the copper floating on the top there. Go ahead and just pass it around, don't spill it. Um, and the copper, if you don't kind of move it around too much, the copper is literally sitting on the zinc through a direct transfer there. Now you could definitely shake it up and then the copper would sort of fall off. You could separate them and then you could actually have solid pieces of copper to do with what you want. All right, so here are just some notes about the salt bridge that I asked you to write yesterday. And uh, let's just discuss this again. But you had a sheet of paper with some notes on, right? So we're just going to look at that and make sure that what you have in your notes um, is what's on the slide. 
So the salt bridge is that U-shaped tube containing a gel with soluble ions. The important thing is that you want them to be soluble and not precipitating with something. So sodium, which or any group 1A is important. Sulfates and nitrates are commonly used. These ions do not play a role in the redox reaction, so they're spectators. And then ions from the salt bridge must not react with ions in the electrolytic solution to form a precipitate. If that does occur, remember that the cell won't die immediately. It just rapidly decreases how long it will last. Because even though you might be precipitating, you still can maintain neutrality with your ions. Uh, but it will precipitate, precipitate, and then you're eventually there won't be ions left uh, in order to maintain neutrality or even to do the oxidation or reduction. So at some point, it's just going to cease to continue. Um, ions from the salt bridge keep the solutions in half cells neutral, but you also need to make sure that your salt bridge is neutral. So if ions, like a negative ion, leaves the salt bridge, a negative ion will enter on the other end. So everything has to maintain neutrality. And if they don't, the reaction will stop, and then we say that the battery is dead. Uh, so this is just a picture of what's happening in your salt bridge. There were our AP questions, I think maybe 2014. They had a picture of a salt bridge, and they asked you to specifically draw the ions and the direction in which they moved, either to the cathode or the anode. So yesterday, I had you write down like that what kind of particle always goes to the cathode and what kind of particle always goes to the anode. You don't have to memorize that information. You can just sort through it and think about it to figuring out what's happening. If at your cathode you're being reduced, that means that your positive charge is leaving the solution, which means you would have a buildup of negative. So then your salt bridge has to supply positive ions to the, to the cathode, right? And then the same thing here, if it's oxidized, it means you're creating a plus charge on, this, on the anode side, so you would have to neutralize that by adding in a negative charge from your salt bridge. So, not necessary to memorize, just kind of think it through if you know all your topics. So it's showing you because zinc is a plus two, that a sulfate ion with a minus two charge will come in here. And then it's also showing you that if a sulfate ion leaves the salt bridge, a sulfate ion has to enter the salt bridge on this side. And then on the next one, we, I think it might be on the next slide, if we're doing this one, two sodium ions have to enter the solution to balance out the copper plus two leaving. So make sure that your charges uh, stay neutral. So in this one, again, if it's two plus going to a solid, then two positive sodiums have to leave. And then because two sodium positives are leaving, you have to enter in a zinc plus two into the salt bridge. So everything maintains neutrality. Everybody okay with that? All right. This is not necessary for your understanding of... Um, like the curriculum. This is not part of the curriculum. There's like about five slides here that's going to talk about why electrons flow from the anode to the cathode um, and really discuss about potential energy. So I'm going to really quickly go through it. I'm not going to even go through many of the slides just for the sake of time. Um, but it gives you an idea of how to understand what voltage really is. And your uh, 5 to 5 book does a good job about voltage, and you could certainly look online for better information. I'm not great with voltage. So I like all the chemistry parts, but like understanding voltage, um, I think I'm on like a basic level to be honest with you. So you can ask me questions and it'll probably help me figure it out more, but we'll just look at it in terms of potential energy. So this says potential energy for electrons is higher at the anode than it is at the cathode. So anode is where you're being oxidized. And in nature, everything moves from high energy systems to low energy systems. So high potential energy means things are far away from one another, right? We do this with molecules all the time. This is high potential energy, and then we're moving to a low potential energy system. So if they're high potential energy at the anode, then they want to reach a low potential energy system at the cathode. And so things naturally move to achieve a state of lower potential energy. This is an example from like physics. A rock will naturally fall under the influence of gravity to obtain a lower gravitational potential energy. We can think of electrons almost like the rock. So here's our little physics guy who's holding this rock who's already gone down to the bottom. Think of this like the electron is over here at the cathode already. So the electron, we can assume this is the electron. Here's my cathode. Here's my anode. So electrons are going to flow from the anode to the cathode. Say he already reaches the cathode. It's already down there. You can think of voltage in terms of how much energy would be required to pull that electron back to the anode. 
it doesn't want to go to the anode, right? The anode is where it gives up electrons. The cathode is where it's accepting the electrons. So it doesn't want to get pulled back the other way. That would be the opposite, right? It would require energy to do that because electrons are attracted to the other side, to the cathode. Same idea if you were trying to pull a rock up a hill, you would just apply energy to pull that back up. The amount of energy that's needed to pull those electrons back is the voltage of the battery. So voltage is going to be like a joules unit almost. I'll show you that with this. So your volts is your joules, the amount of energy required to pull back the coulombs of electrons. Remember we calculated moles of electrons and coulombs, right? We know that Faraday's constant, that conversion factor. So it's 96,500 coulombs per one mole of electrons. So however many coulombs I'm pull pulling, you can think of as moles of electrons you're pulling, would require a certain amount of energy. So the more electrons you have to pull back, the more energy that's required. So this is giving you for one electron how many coulombs that would be. Um, and then it says that number of electrons contains a negative one coulomb of charge. Negative because electrons <coughs> are negative. So we're going to look at really the joules that's pulling that. So this is showing you how a 12 volt battery comes about. So we have our anode and our cathode, which is our electron already went down there. And I'm going to try and pull that electron back. It says the potential difference, voltage, the change in voltage, is the change in electrical potential energy per unit charge, so the charge of that electron. It would take 12 joules of energy to pull negative one coulomb of charge, which is this number of electrons, from the cathode to the anode. So that's a lot of electrons, right? And so these are the number of electrons. We're pulling them back up. It takes 12 joules of energy. So the overall change would be your 12 joules for that one coulomb of charge, which gives you your 12 volts. Following? So the less energy would give you a less voltage, which I think yesterday somebody said would, I don't know if it was your class, but does a 9-volt battery die faster than a 12-volt battery? No. It just is a different amount of energy required to pull back those electrons. You can think of it that way. Uh, so this is just showing you as he pulls them back up. The energy is converted to kinetic energy as they spontaneously flow back to the cathode. So here's an overall summary of that. I'm just going to give you like a minute to read through this yourself and then just ask me any questions. Okay, any questions? Make sense? I mean, to some degree, it should make sense to you. Just understanding that 12 volts means more energy than 9 volts, right? But still, electrons are flowing. It just doesn't mean that it's going to die faster. It's just a different amount of energy for those. Uh, so this is not curriculum based. This is just to help you understand what voltage actually means. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Uh, so other words for potential difference. You will see this though. So you're definitely going to see all of these words. You'll see them probably, some of them in the older format questions. They like to use the word electromotive force, EMF. So EMF is the force that causes electrons to move. So they're flowing from your anode to your cathode. We'll call that EMF. The standard EMF is just at standard conditions. So standard conditions we've always learned since uh, thermodynamics. They are one atmosphere, one molar concentrations, and what temperature? 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, E-cell, so these are also potential differences. This is the one that you're most commonly going to use. E-cell is your cell potential. Then E-standard cell is your standard cell potential at the standard conditions. And then what we really use is cell voltage so that we can calculate the volts of your cell or your battery. So if we calculate a 12 volt battery, that's where you'll get those. That's all the same. So if I ask you to calculate cell potential, this is the same thing as the voltage, electromotive force, standard electromotive force, E cell potential, and then E cell standard conditions. The unit for all of the above is voltage. It's just they're going to ask it to you in a variety of ways, which kind of stinks. You just have to recognize all of these things mean volts. Calculate volts. So this slide's important so that you can pay attention to what you're supposed to solve. Uh, these are your standard conditions. We know this. Okay. And then standard reduction potentials. All right. This is the list that you no longer get. So it used to be given to you. Literally, I printed this up from one of the AP exams. It's this list you would just go to and you would find all of your reduction potentials and then you're going to use them to calculate voltage. Because you don't get it anymore, it just means that it makes your life a little simpler because the problem is going to give it to you. So I'm going to just show you an example of how that would look. Uh, so here's a 
great example. Do you see this chart right here? I'm going to put it right here so we can see it on the slide. The chart tells you your reduction potentials. It gives you the reaction, and then it tells you what the voltage is. So instead of you having to look it up, it gives you the options right there, and you figure them out. All right, most important thing about this is that you hear that I'm saying, and you read that it says reduction potentials. If you're going to have a redox reaction, what two things do you need to occur? Oxidation and reduction. So if you only get the reduction potential list, you're going to have to calculate or determine what the oxidation number is, not just the reduction. You can't just have reductions, right? You have to have reductions and oxidations. So in order for us to calculate an oxidation of this, we flip it. And if we flip it, we flip the sign. So if you have like a negative voltage for a forward reduction reaction, and I reverse it to an oxidation reaction, I have to flip the sign. Does everybody understand that? So you might want to write that on this little chart here. Flip it, flip the sign for oxidation. So it says the standard potentials for all half cell reactions are used to calculate the standard cell potential for the overall. By convention, all standard half cell potentials are given as reduction potentials. They will always be given to you as a reduction on an AP exam. And then they report the number to you here. So for example, if I am solving the reduction of copper, and so this is being reduced, how do I know it's being reduced? This is like some really fundamental basic details that your brain has to wrap around because the electrons are where? On the left, which means they're gaining them and gaining electrons means reduction, right? So you look at where they are. If you're gaining electrons, then this is the reduction value and it's positive 0.3 volts. So go ahead uh, and write the oxidation of this. Literally write out the oxidation reaction. I want the oxidation reaction and I want my E oxidation. Okay, so the reverse of this would be the oxidation, which is oxidations for these metals are always the solid piece is going to the charge state and then you lose your electrons. That's what oxidation means, right? Leo says ger. So loss of electrons goes off on this side. So if I'm going to flip it, that should make sense to you, right? That this then has to be negative 0.34. That is your oxidation, not your reduction potential. Reduction potentials have to be for reduction reactions. Oxidation potentials are for oxidation reactions. Everybody okay with that? All right, here are some of your reduction values, but you have the list now um, to use. So just make note that you have to follow specifically what you're given. So there's not just, uh, like on this one, it's just giving you copper with a plus two state, but there's also a copper with the plus one state. So just make sure that you're picking the exact reaction. You can't just pick one that seems close enough. Uh, yesterday, we quickly learned when we watched that little video blurb where these numbers come from. They all come from the reduction of hydrogen in water. So this is sort of like our carbon-12. You know how we base the rest of the mass of the periodic table off of the fact that carbon has a mass of 12. So it has six protons and six neutrons, so we say its mass is 12. And then we put pretty much uh, relate everything to it, right? We've used this example before. I think I used it with Argo. I'm like 0.5 Argos. If he's the standard, then I'm 0.5 and so forth. Okay. So if this is our standard that we're relating everything against, then this is where all these other numbers come from. It's just trying to help you gauge where it all comes about. Um, and then this is showing you how easily oxidized and how easily reduced certain species are. So here's what is important for you to understand. It says, increasing ability to attract electrons get reduced. Silver is at the top of the list. This means that this one is going to be, if I had a choice between this and this, this will get reduced. Because this is going to be more easily reduced. These have their increase, increasing ability to lose electrons or to be oxidized. So things at the bottom of the list here are more likely to be oxidized. So the take home message here, and you have to know this, write this on that little sheet that we did yesterday, is that the most positive reduction value gets reduced. So the most positive 
reduction value gets reduced. So you will write the half reaction as is, which means like as it is on the table. You're going to choose that one as your half reaction reduced. And then I'll write something about the oxidation. So sometimes our brains like, you know, choose on the test to decide that instead of delta G is supposed to be negative, that all of a sudden we want it to be positive. Well, how do you remember that you have to choose the most positive? Think of it this way. Something that's getting reduced is accepting electrons, correct? I'll wait till you guys are all ready to. This is so important that you choose the right one. And I see students choose the wrong one. They choose the most negative. So why are you going to choose the most positive? A reduction means that you gain electrons, right? Opposites attract. So if this is the most positive value, positive meaning it can attract the electrons the most. Got it? So reductions are accepting electrons. I want to choose the most positive value so that it can attract the electrons. Maybe jot that down somewhere. So the most positive value, maybe just put here, can attract electrons more readily. That's why you're choosing the most positive. So you're going to get two different pieces of a reaction, and you have to choose which will go in which half cell which species is going to get oxidized, and which species will get reduced. So if I give you two choices, you're looking for the most positive reduction value in your reduction list, and you choose that one to be reduced. So then I write that down. I would write down the reduction of that. So say, for example, I'm giving you the choice between copper and zinc. Okay, you have two choices. Which one gets reduced? Copper gets reduced because it's 0.34 volts. And zinc is negative 0.76. All right, but because I have a redox reaction, one is being oxidized and one is being reduced. So since we just said that copper is going to be reduced, I'm writing this reduction exactly as it appears there, which is a reduction because it's gaining electrons. But if I'm going to now do the other piece, which is writing the zinc, I'm not going to write zinc like this because what is that? That's a reduction, and what do I need? And oxidation. So instead, I'm flipping it to write the oxidation. You know you're doing something wrong if your electrons don't cancel, right? So this is why it's important is that you're choosing the right one, then you're writing that half reaction as it is, and then you flip the oxidation reaction from the chart. Because the chart is only going to give you the reductions. So even though I'm giving you a large chart, on a question where you have four choices perhaps, you still have to do the same process. It's just making it easier for you to choose. And then you would combine them and write your net ionic. So sometimes it makes you choose. Sometimes it gives you information to choose. If I told you that one of these was a solid, right? then you would know that you had to start with them being a solid, so you must be choosing the oxidation for that. So use clues in the question to help you figure out if you are even being reduced or oxidized. All right, so which species will be reduced? It says the species with the most positive, least negative reduction value will be reduced as it has the greatest ability to attract electrons. An electron can only decrease its potential energy by moving to the species with the most positive, least negative reduction value, which is what I wrote here. So you already jotted that down. All right, I don't use this slide. I'm going to show you what I would write. And this is what you should write for the rest of the year. If you choose to do it a different way and you ask me questions about why you got something wrong, I am literally going to just tell you because you didn't do it my way. Because I know that this gets confusing for students. And if you choose to do it my way, you'll get it right. Okay? So don't just be defiant to do it a different way. So what you're going to write is that E cell is equal to E reduction plus E oxidation, which makes so much sense to do it this way. 
So we're not going to use this. Just cross it off. The reason why this makes sense to do this is because you're already going to flip the reaction yourself because you have to get the correct voltage. So why not just write it like that instead of writing it like that where you have to put a negative sign and then recognize to flip your voltage. But what if you flip your voltage and you still use the negative, then you get the wrong answer. So this is going to be the E reduction value directly from the table after you chose which one to, is going to be reduced. And then this one is the one that you flip. And then you just add them together. That's it. You flip yours and you combine them. You don't have to worry about negative signs or anything. You just flip them and combine it. And then you'll get your overall cell, which is always in volts. OK, let's try this problem. It says. What is the cell potential for a voltaic cell, which also can be called what? Galvanic cell that has nickel at one electrode and copper at the other. The cells are kept at 25 degrees C, and all ions in solution have one molar concentrations. So it's giving you, but you can look them up because they're the same here. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because on your homework and on some of the AP questions, you're not going to get it directly given to you. You're going to have to look them up. So it says copper is this, this is my reduction potential, and then this is the reduction potential for nickel. Now we have to calculate cell potential. So we're looking for which one's reduced, which one's oxidized, let's add them together. So from this choice, who gets reduced? This gets reduced. And what happens to this one? It gets oxidized. So what I would suggest you do even if the question's not asking you to do it, is I would immediately kind of cross that out and flip it myself because almost all problems are going to ask you to write a net ionic equation for your redox reaction. So I would flip it and then I would write E ox <coughs> equals positive 0.25 volts. If you do it right away, then in part D of the question, when it asks you to finally do it, you're not going to get confused. So do the work in the beginning to show yourself what it is. So this has to be my choice for oxidation. So I'm going to just flip the sign. So now if I calculate the cell voltage, it's super simple because you've already done the work for yourself. You already said it's 0.34, and I already said the oxidation is 0.25, so I just add them together. So 0.34 volts plus 0.25 volts gives me 0.59 volts. <clears throat> Any questions? All right, it has to be a positive value. Why? Yep. Your galvanic cells will always be positive. If you get a negative, you did something wrong. Does that make sense? Batteries are meant to work. Our cells, galvanic means spontaneous, that it's going to work. It has to be a positive voltage. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? You don't pick up a negative 12-volt battery. You pick up a 12-volt battery. So it has to be a positive value. We're going to get to this, but I'm going to keep reminding you. If it's a positive value, that means it's spontaneous, so delta G is negative. It also means that K is greater than 1. We're going to tie it all in. So a positive value for E cell means that the reaction is a thermodynamically favored process, hence the negative, hence the K greater than 1. <clears throat> Any questions with that? OK. Next one. Determine the value of the standard cell potential for a Beltaic cell operating on a reaction between silver nitrate <coughs> and solid nickel. Here are your choices. OK. So go ahead and calculate it yourself. 
So we have to look at the list here. The most positive is silver. It even told you that if you were smart, you would have just looked there and it told you. But let's pretend that we didn't see that. So this is the most positive value. So silver is going to get reduced. And I'm going to flip it so that I have nickel solid going to Ni plus 2 plus 2 electrons. And I flip my value to positive point. 0.25 volts. So now when I add these together, I'm just putting together the 0 0.80 plus the 0.25, and I get 1.05 <laughs> volts total, positive. Did we get that? Yeah. All right, question. Yeah, about the two? Yeah. Right, I'm going to talk about it right now. When you have the fact that you've multiplied two electrons, so what Nelson's referring to is the fact that we have to do this, right? Even though like we've learned in thermodynamics when you multiply something, you must multiply the voltage, you don't here. The reason is your amount of work, your joules per coulomb, are going to cancel. So in other words, if I had 12 joules per one coulomb of electrons, if I wanted to pull back two of them, then it would be 24 joules per two coulombs. You would get the same thing. So you don't need to multiply your voltage because if you're trying to drag back those electrons from the cathode, if you have to drag back more electrons, you're going to require more energy. So the voltage will stay the same. So you do not have to multiply. You do need to multiply for balancing your equation, but you're not going to multiply your voltages. Does everybody understand that? So when you look at this slide, it says you do not multiply the voltage when you multiply the equation by two. If you double the number of electrons, you also double the energy needed to pull them back. So it's just going to be still the same exact value. Just make sure though that you balance your chemical equation. Questions on that? You don't have this slide? No, we don't have. Wow. Do you have this one? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, we do. Oh, well, that's weird. We have that slide, but we don't have any of the stuff written on two. Oh, yeah. Well, jot something down. Like I just said, don't multiply the voltage by 2 even if necessary for the equation. And then you should write down something about the fact that you're supplying double the amount of energy for double the amount of electrons. So it would just balance out.